Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back into our ter maintaining terrestrial biodiversity. I'm your teacher, Mr. Stano. And today we're going to take a little look at tropical deforestation and then go on to how we manage our grasslands. Um, when we last left off, we were just talking about deforestation in general, especially a little bit more into the United States. Now we're going to take a look a little bit out in other places around the world. We see tropical deforestation like what's appearing here in the Amazon, and we can see a number of the different roads, how they come on in. Here, so you can see an access road here and how they're branching off of that access road to go into different areas to remove timber. Now, we see this happening. We know it's happening. We have satellite images such as we see here uh, that where countries are exploiting their tropical rainforest at a pretty fast rate. Um, at least half of the world's terrestrial plant and animal species live in tropical rainforests. Remember, these are those bio, these highly biodiverse areas that, um, because of their vertical structure, the amount of productivity in those areas can support the biodiversity. Large areas of these tropical forests are being burned to make way for cattle ranches and for crops such as sugarcane or corn. Uh, we do see it. It does happen. Why should we care? Well, there are, besides the certain economic benefits, uh, sorry, the ecological services that they do provide for us, there is a number of other th chemicals and compounds that do come from these areas uh, from plants that are within these forest areas. So by protecting them, such as we see here, we may be uh, holding on to some cures or some uh, cancer-fighting chemicals from these areas. Causes of tropical deforestation and degradation? there are a number of things that are connected uh, that end up having it. So basic causes, we're not valuing the ecological service that they're playing. So we're, we're not valuing how much CO2 they take in or the amount of water filtration that goes on. Uh, government policies may be existing or non-existing. Poverty, when people do not have money, they need to find ways to provide for their family. And if it means exploiting some sort of natural uh, resource, they're going to. Population growth, probably the biggest one and worst one. As a result, what we see is between oil drilling, mining, flooding for dams, uh, which we do see as dams are created, they're going to be flooding upstream areas for the re reservoirs behind them. Tree plantations, cash crops, any number of these things right here are ways that our tropical forests are getting degraded. What we can do? Uh, reducing subsidies is probably one of the bigger ones that encourage by... Um, Adding subsidies that encourage sustainable forest use that will help protect our uh, rainforest or removing subsidies on other industries, maybe a certain oil drilling or exploration. By removing subsidies from those, then they'll be less prone to go into tropical forests. So it can work in two different ways. Uh, educate settlers about sustainable agriculture. Reduce the illegal cutting, which we see over in Asia, where actually China will will go in to other countries and take um, and remove their forest and then imp import it into theirs. Um, it's being done and seen there and illegally too. There is a woman, uh, Wangari uh, Maithau, who founded the Green Belt Movement, also re awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004, uh, where she basically organizes poor women to plant for fuel wood and protect millions of trees. And she started this Green Belt Movement in Kenya. So now, kind of switching gears from our tropical rainforest, we're going to look at our grasslands. So grasslands are heavily impacted by livestock and grazing. So they have natural grasslands, which are rangelands, and then we have our managed grasslands, which are known as pastures. So we can sustain rangeland productivity by controlling the number and distribution of livestock and by restoring degraded rangeland. We can do this in a number of different ways. Some of the cool ways I've seen are with satellites. They'll go in and look at productivity of certain grasslands and manage and move herds into these areas so that they do not overgraze and then move them back into others. Pretty neat what we can do with satellites. So overgrazing occurs when too many animals graze on an area for too long, exceeding the carrying capacity of that grassland area. Going in, removing all that vegetation, and like what you can see here, when you remove it, it ends up leaving these bare spots will then open up for erosion to occur. Example, restored area along the San Pedro River. So when we manage the area, reduce the overgrazing, you can see how it can come back eventually through succession. Grazing on and urban development in America West. It's, ha it's 
a big study. Uh, ranchers, ecologists, and environmentalists are joining together to preserve the grasslands where the cattle are. So we can pay con uh, ranchers conservation easements, barring future owners from development. Uh, we see this actually out east on Long Island too, uh, not with ranching, but with certain uh, types of uh, buildup of the area. Uh, pressuring government to zone the land to pre uh, prevent development of ecologically sensitive areas so that we do not lose these rangelands. Then we're going to have our national parks moving into a little bit different area than from our grasslands. So here in the United States, we're lucky to have about 1,100 national parks, um, but they are threatened by human activity. Local people will invade for a, either poaching purposes or removal of some resource from there. Their many are too small to sustain large animal species because they're not as big as they need to be, and many suffer from invasive species. Um, they do get stressed quite a bit. They're overused due to popularity. People like going to see these pristine or well, once pristine areas, and sometimes they have private ownership within them of these inholdings, which may threaten natural resources. So these are just some suggestions for sustaining our national parks or expanding them. So survey wildlife and parks, increasing funding is one of the bigger things. Bri pri buying up private land or inholdings that may be within the parks or add new parkland near threatened parks to expand them and make them bigger. Then we have nature reserves. These are call, uh, ecologists basically call for protecting more land to help sustain biodiversity, uh, but powerful economic and political interests are definitely opposed doing this, especially if there is some sort of resource on that land that is needed or wanted. Uh, currently, 12% of the Earth's land area is protected. You can see this is a little bit better than our marine reserves, where it's less than 1%. Only 5% is strictly protected from harmful human activities. And we would like to get up to about 20% of Earth's land being uh, nature reserves. So here, we can see here in Costa Rica, they have definitely a, an amazement um, network of nature reserves and people go and tourists will go here for this, check it out, these nature reserves. Large and medium sized reserves with buffer zones to help protect biodiversity can be connected by environmental corridors. These environmental corridors can be used in a number of areas, but what they do is they allow for wildlife to move through into different reserves while being protected at the same time. So here, this just shows like a model of how you can create a nature reserve and still have certain uh, establishments within it. GIS systems or geographic information systems are becoming huge uh, and popular in, the ma in maintaining, building, and kind of figuring out a network of nature reserves. And it's basically using satellites to get information and layering that on top of maps and laying it with more information to try to identify and establish these areas that could be used for reserves. And it can also help prevent fragmentation of them. So we can use that all to kind of help protect, build, and maintain our nature reserves. In, in turn, this will slow down losses of biodiversity and kind of help protect our global hotspots. And this is looking at just the number of different hotspots that have been identified by ecologists around the world. So you can see it located just where they're roughly located. Nature reserves. So these wilderness inland is legally set aside in large enough area to prevent or minimize harm from human activities. But only a small percentage of the land of the area in the United States has been protected as wilderness. So wilderness is, uh, once again, another area that we'd like to explore, but only a small percentage has been set aside as wilderness. What we can do. Ecological restoration, how we can fix this as restoration, rehabilitation, replacement, and creating artificial ecosystems are such ways that we can kind of build up and keep maintain our natural areas and biodiversity. Okay, there's five basic science-based principles for ecological restoration. So we have to identify a cause, stop abuse of that area, reintroduce species if necessary, such as the wolves, um, protect area from further degradation, and then use adaptive manage management to monitor efforts that are being done, access to success. We wanna make sure what we're doing is working, and even if it's not working, how can we figure out ways to modify it? Will restoration encourage further destruction? It's a possibility. There is some concern that ecological restoration could promote further environmental destruction. Um, 
suggesting that any ecological harm can be undone. Uh, but preventing ecosystem damage is far cheaper than ecological restoration. So why better to prevent it than to actually have to go back and fix it, which we've seen in a number of cases uh, stated earlier this year, especially when maintaining our waterways and systems. What we could do, eight priorities for protecting biodiversity. We can take immediate action to preserve world's biological hotspots. Probably our number one big thing, keeping that biodiversity up. Keep intact remaining old growth forests, whatever is left. Complete mapping the world's biodiversity uh, for inventory and decision making. Knowing which species are in certain areas will help create a hierarchy of what may we should or what we should protect at certain times. Uh, ensure that the full range of the Earth's ecosystems are included in global conservation strategy. Every area uh, is important in its own way and provides a certain ecological services to us. Uh, make conservation profitable instead of uh, looking at it as something that maybe money is dumped into with no return on investment. And these are just a number of different things that we can do, such as adopting a forest, planting trees and taking care of them. Um, landscape yard so that it contains uh, it increases biodiversity within the area and that's about it so i hope you enjoyed this screencast a little long uh but huge amount of information uh that is needed to help us pertain uh protect and sustain our terrestrial biodiversity hope you enjoyed these take care